Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to make your airbrushed models look better. To prep my models, I'll typically mount them on uh, these pill bottles. I just have a bunch of these, like, super large pill bottles, and then I use Loctite blue poster tack on the flat parts that are going to be lining up with my base. Uh, when it comes to games where I'm not using a ton of models or my basing is a little bit more complex, I prefer to do this with my models to make sure that I can do a really cool base and not have to worry about what the, uh, what the airbrushing is going to do to that or how I work under the model. Next I'm using one of my sculpting tools on that blue tack just to try and get it away from paintable parts. If I keep the bottoms clean, it just uh, works better when I'm gluing. Typically when someone who's new to airbrushing or wants to learn about airbrushing approaches me, they always ask what airbrush should I start out with? And I think a lot of people end up gravitating towards the mid-range airbrushes because they kind of treat it like a car or an appliance. They don't want to get something that's too cheap and they don't want to get something that's too expensive because it might have things that are features that they might not really engage in. So what I like to tell people is really aim for cheap airbrushes when you're first starting out. If you're just going to be doing like zenithal highlighting or priming only, then that's probably where you should start out because the, the thing with those is that the airbrush is not a super complicated device. I mean, it, it can, they can get pretty expensive based on who you buy them from, but essentially the airbrush is a quite simple design. And when you get these things from eBay that are like $20, these little Chinese burner airbrushes, they do what they're supposed to do. They push paint through the nozzle with air, and the nozzles are large enough to where you don't have to worry about the clogging being really hard to, to, to undo because there's quite a bit of room to work with. And if you end up wrecking that airbrush, it's you're not out a lot. Typically when you do something like mess up a nozzle on an Iowata, depending on the model that you have, you could be looking at $60 for a nozzle, and that's kind of a hard cost to just eat out of nowhere. But when you burn a, a crappy $20 airbrush that's been priming and highlighting your models for you for a year and a half, that's not really a big deal. Now once you get past that, the airbrushes that I tend to go towards are Iowata and Infinity airbrushes. The one we're going to be using in this video is an Iowata HPCH, and those ones have really small nozzles but can still do quite a bit of work with them so that I can do things like feather and do some really thin line highlighting. But for someone who's new, I definitely wouldn't point them towards one of those. When you're looking for a new airbrush for yourself, there's really two things two different types of airbrushes that I would consider out there. The first one would be the uh, the siphon fed airbrush and essentially what this one does is you've got this bottle on the bottom that you fill up with paint and then there's a straw in it that ends up shooting paint into here through its own mechanics. I'm not sure the science. I'm pretty sure what happens is air goes down in here and then pushes the paint up and then shoots it out the airbrush. Like I said, very simple mechanisms to do this. And uh, the reason why I have one of these is because it's really good for priming large things. Um, it, you can just put a ton of paint in this little bottle and just go to town and you don't have to worry about it. The other type of airbrush is the gravity fed airbrush. This is the one that we'll be using in the video here and it's just got this well on the top that you can fill up with paint and you can see down into the needle mechanism and essentially air shoots through here and it takes paint with it and you get it and that's how it works. It's pretty simple, but this is typically what I would use for most of the things that I airbrush with. I really don't like those airbrushes that have this really small gravity well up here. I just don't find much of a use for them. Like, you can get this big one and just put less paint in it and you'll be fine. Now, when you're another thing to look at when you're looking for an airbrush for yourself is uh, you want a dual action airbrush. And what that means is you push the trigger down, that's one action, and that will uh, trigger the, the air to flow, right? There's a little knob, knob down here that'll make it so that uh, you open up the valves to shoot air out of this, uh, out of this tip. Now, the second thing, the, part, the dual part of the dual action, is that the trigger on this airbrush moves backwards. And what that does is there's a needle that runs along in here, and when you can pull the needle back, you control how much paint shoots out the front side of the airbrush. And there's, uh, since the, uh, the trigger up here is variable too, you can kind of control the paint just, or the airflow just a little bit that way. But uh, mostly you're drawing the needle back 
to choose whether you want to throw a lot of paint out of the front of this airbrush, which is usually not what you want to do, or a little bit. So that's the gist between dual action, so, or with dual action. So if you were starting out new, get a $20 burner airbrush and a dual action, one that's gravity fed. Now the question that new airbrush users don't ask that they should be asking is what kind of air compressor should I use? Because you have to think about the air compressor as the source of power for your airbrush. And if your airbrush costs you $500, it really could perform like a turd because you've got this junky little air compressor running it. So the thing that most people end up picking up when they first start airbrushing is the on-demand air compressors. And this is fine if you've got a really condensed space and you need to be able to pack up your air, your hobbying setup and then be able to uh, put that away so that you can unpack it later to do it because you don't have like a dedicated hobby space. They work good for that. But the problems that I have with on-demand airbrush or air compressor systems is that you are always generating the air when you need it instead of just storing it. So the way that air compressors work is typically the air that they're pushing out is a little bit warmer because there's a lot of movement to make that air uh, generate, right? So that ends up kind of making it so you can get some condensation popping out of your airbrush every now and again and that's just like a little water puff and you could be working on a really fine highlight and you just get this droplet of water that your air that your air compressors created and then it just destroys all of the uh, highlighting that you've been working on. The other thing that I don't like about them is they typically don't have the most steady and consistent airflow. So you end up getting maybe your, your highlights end up working a little bit different because the air isn't always coming out at a consistent rate. You know, it's always got this like vibrating or um, oscillating air pressure to it. So I typically don't like those. I appreciate their convenience, but it's not something I always go for when it comes to airbrushing. What I look for in an air compressor are three things. I want an oilless air compressor, so it's not something that I have to screw with maintenance-wise. And I also don't have to worry about cleanup should anything go wrong. I also look for an, a built-in regulator. The other thing that I would look for is a tank that the air compressor puts in or stores the air in. They typically run my PSI about 15 to 20 and that seems a little high compared to most airbrush users but I feel like it gives me a quick working time with the paint because it kind of dries while it's hitting the model and doesn't feel like it's drying before it hits the model. And I, I feel like I found that sweet spot of like this is a high enough PSI to where it's not going to be drying out the tip and making it harder for me to paint as, uh, as I'm going along. Now that my model's mounted up, I'm going to grab some Vallejo Surface Primer. This is just their regular black color. Uh, and then I'm going to mix that uh, about 50-50 with my thinning agent to, uh, and I just use, it's not a fancy mix. I just put some products together and, uh, and some distilled water, and then that's what I thin my paints down with. I think it's like a little bit of matte medium, a little bit of flow aid, and then boom, it's good to go. So 50-50 mix seems to work pretty well. Uh, I always thin my primers down. Uh, you can always layer them again with another coat if you feel like it's not quite thick enough for you. Uh, but regardless of whether the model's resin, plastic, or metal, I'll use this type of primer. And I really don't think that there's much of a difference between all the different airbrush primers out there between Steinal Res or Scale 7.5 or whatever. I think Vallejo just works really well for me and that's the one that I stick with. But I don't think there's any advantages or disadvantages to one over the other. As you can see me spraying my primer on, it looks a little thin, and that's not a big deal because I can just kind of run back over it once it's dry and thicken it up a little bit, because uh, you can see it's kind of pooling to the recesses a little bit and it's showing some of that metal underneath. One of the things I'm going to be doing in a little bit here is uh, I end up spraying one of the parts with uh, just straight air that kind of hasn't been gripping primer really well. And what that does is it just kind of dries the paint, the what little paint has stuck onto the model. And then I can go back over and just spray it again with that primer and make sure that I've got a nice thick coat. Now, when it comes to priming models, you don't need to cover it as completely as I am here. This is just a force of habit for me. You just need to get paint on enough paint on the model to make sure that it sticks. Now the style of painting, I guess you could call the, the technique we're going to be using in this video, is going to be a zenithal 
well, I wouldn't call it zenithal priming, it would be zenithal highlighting more than anything, but essentially what that is is you consider the airbrush as the direction of the light source that you're working with, and for me, like most people, I just, it's high noon everywhere because you consider the sun to be the highest in the sky right above you, and then your base coat is all around the model, that's your dark color, then there's going to be your, high, your first highlight coming at a 90 degree angle, so that kind of shows that there's light, a light source above the thing that you're working on, and then finally you end up having uh, your final highlight coming from straight down, showing that this is the brightest colors coming from the source of the light. So uh, I know that you can always you can always tilt that a little bit if you want to make it look a little different, but for my from my experience of playing games and painting models, it honestly doesn't really matter where you send that from unless you're getting into like different sources of light where maybe you've got a candle in the corner of the model and you want some light bouncing off of them from that direction or you're getting into diorama building but for the most part we're just talking about playing models on a table so having that light source coming straight from above is going to work just fine for you. So I used a hair dryer to accelerate the drying time on this one. Uh, I know some people like to let this stuff sit overnight or for a couple hours but I can just zap it with a hair dryer and move on. For the base coat, I'm going to be using uh, Games Workshop's foundation paint, or base paint, I think they call them these days. Uh, this is Incubi Darkness. It's probably one of my favorite paints, but I am going with kind of more of a privateer press uh, gallery image for, the, for this particular uh, uh, swamp horror. So this stuff, when it comes to thinning your paint uh, for airbrushing, typically you want it just a little bit thinner because you can, if you have the PSI on your airbrush set right, you can kind of dry the paint as you're uh, painting it on without kind of jamming up your tip a little bit. So typically I'll run my compressor about 15 to 20 PSI, and I know that some people are going to think that's a little bit high, but it works well for me, and I don't feel like I get a lot of these, like, drying out tip problems that a lot of people have uh, just because I know how to thin my paint down to what I need it for the airbrush. Now this stuff here when you look at the little pin that I've got hanging out the paint right now is a little thin or a little thick I mean so I'm going to thin it down just a little bit more and add a little bit more paint to this because honestly I'm not used to working within these uh these tin caps so it's hard for me to visualize things typically I mix straight into the airbrush but if you're just starting out with airbrushing I probably wouldn't really recommend that because you're bristles can break off in the airbrush and then you've got to deal with cleaning those or any junk that happens to be on your paintbrush whether you use it for like glue or uh, basing with uh, like any kind of texture paints that stuff can get into your airbrush and gunk it up and then you've got to clean it so I think it's better to just mix outside of your airbrush instead of throwing things into it so to kick off this zenithal highlighting type thing we're going to start the base coat just coming at like a a like a what degree is that like it's just straight on so <laughs> I'm just gonna be throwing the paint on there leaving a little bit of black underneath it's not like you're gonna be able to see the black that's underneath there it's just that I don't feel like I need to tilt this model around and get every single angle of the model covered with this incubi darkness paint Now that this coat's dry, I'm gonna move on to my first highlight color, and that's going to be from Army, Army Painter, and it's called uh, Hawk Turquoise. God damn it, that's not Hawk Turquoise. That's the color I wish it was, but this is Hydra Turquoise, and uh, we're gonna do a 90 degree spray. So essentially, I've, I'm tilting my uh, mounting device, which pill bottle is not a mounting device, Brian, this isn't Games Workshop, but uh, I'm tilting my pill bottles to try and uh, fake this 90 degree angle instead of just holding it like I'm now doing so, which is I think what most people would do. And you can already see we're getting some definition on this model and showing those highlights. With that coat dry, we're gonna move on to the next highlight for this. And I've got quite a bit of this Hydra Turquoise hanging out and now I got Butterfingers too. And we're gonna mix in a little bit of Vallejo model color sky blue. Now this paint is super duper thick, so I've probably overmixed it a little bit here. And now we got some chunky stuff that I wanna pull out because I don't want that going in my airbrush at all. And then we're gonna thin that down. And this is, again, when it comes to figuring out how thin you want your paints, you usually want them a little bit thinner when they're going through an airbrush. And I've kind of overmixed the 
the sky blue now, so I need to mix in more uh, hydro turquoise back into it. And this is kind of the cons this is the color that I'm looking for, but it's definitely not the consistency that I want. So this is where I get to do the don't do or do as I say and not as I do moment, where I'm mixing more water into my airbrush uh, because I just uh, there's too much paint in that cup, and if I were to thin it down, it would just be. Uh, a massive amount of paint but this is why you keep um, extra bottles empty bottles hanging around so that you can just uh, fill those up with your excess paint but you can see I'm just going straight from the top of this model with this color to get that really super bright highlight on there so I think this is where a lot of new airbrush painters stop painting when it comes to this zenithal highlighting but for us we're going to keep going a little bit further but you can see why someone would want to stop here especially if they're newer to painting because you've got some nice shadows here and some mid-tones and some nice highlights that come across that give you a really dynamic model without without a lot of effort but to bring some extra zing to our model we're going to grab a few things the first one's going to be liquitex flow aid then beel tan green from citadel or games workshop and then Dragonhawk nightshade wash from games workshop the reason why we have this flow aid here is that uh washes tend to really tint the color of the model that you've got uh, they end up kind of really changing the colors that you're that you've already put on it now we spent a lot of time and we're very intentional with the colors we wanted because i wanted this cool teal swamp monster right or swamp horror sorry it's not a swamp i know it's not a swamp monster i know it's a swamp horror but it's a swamp monster now so uh, the, what the Liquitex does is it cuts down the surface tension of that wash and makes it so that it doesn't hang around on the surfaces as much as it usually does. You can kind of paint on a paper towel or finger to see how, how much it spreads. But when I did this, I also found that I was getting more of a green color than a teal color. So I just added a little bit more of that Drakenhoff nightshade in there because I want to maintain this more like true teal color on this Swamp Horror instead of... Uh, kind of going one way or the other towards blue or green. So you can kind of see when I tilt this uh, this tin around that the wash isn't really hanging out on the sides. So that means I'm good to start smashing this wash on and you can be really uh, sloppy with this stuff. You can just load your brush up and go to town because most of the wash is just gonna pool into places where you're either not gonna see it or it's going to or it's gonna just fall off from the edges and onto your uh, your little holding device, whatever you decide to use. Uh, sometimes there are some areas where that wash is gonna build up a lot, and all I end up doing is just kind of pushing it around with the brush, or I can lop it up with the uh, with the brush when it doesn't have a whole lot of uh, wash already loaded onto it, and then that way it'll just come off there and won't dry that way. But what you can see happening now is when we had uh, finished that zenithal priming or highlighting or whatever, uh, we lost a lot of the character within the folds of the Swamp Horror's tentacles, especially in that area between the tentacles where there's like that little flap of skin. So we get to now call those, uh, call those, um, those sculpt, uh, those sculpt details out and, uh, and just show that they're there and give it a little bit more, uh, uh, visual interest, I guess you could say. Now, <clears throat> the nice thing about this with us cutting this down is you can see the the very edges of those tentacles that are hanging out like the the second tentacle that we had there for a minute the color that we put on there originally is still there and we've still got this cool transition between it almost kind of makes our transitions look more intense between the dark and the light and the mid-tones so we're gonna let that dry for a while and see what we get so what we've done with the wash is we've accentuated all the shadows, but you can see we still kind of have a hard time telling where all these highlighted parts are. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a little bit of that sky blue and uh, hydro turquoise mix, and I'm just going to, that I had left over of course, because I mixed like a butt ton of it. Um, I'm just going to mix that down a little bit more with some more of my thinning agent, which I'll just call water because it's not, like I said, it's not super complex. So I want this to be a little bit thinner because we're going to actually paint this on with a brush instead of an airbrush. So uh, I like to get this stuff pretty thin because I want it to flow from the brush really well and I don't want a whole lot kind of getting sucked up into my brush. So I'm just using the very, very tip of this number one brush. And then what I'm doing is I'm finding all of the peaks of the details that are on these tentacles, and I'm just kind of going around and swiping them a little bit with a highlight. Now I wouldn't say that this paint is like glaze quality, and I definitely wouldn't say that you could use, uh, or I mean the consistency, 
I wouldn't say that you could use the, con the consistency of this paint to just paint a model completely with, as, a, as a base coat. So that kind of gives you an idea of how much you need to thin it down. And uh, I'm just going ahead and lightly gliding my, my brush bristles over the peaks of these highlights. Because like I said, we, we accentuated the shadows with the, with the wash. And now we need to accentuate these highlights a little bit so they don't get too lost in the, the small tint that we had on the wash. And uh, we're also, when you, when you prime your model or, or paint your model with this zenithal highlighting style, you're really only getting these details called out from one direction. So it's really easy to lose the details that are on a model and it ends up washing it out quite a bit. So it's almost like after a while when you start seeing things like this on the table, you can tell 100% sure or 100% that they painted them with an airbrush. Not to say that it's bad or anything. It's just that it's very apparent what they've done to get it to look that way. And they end up losing some of the model's details as a result of it. So what we're doing here is just taking a little bit of extra time after putting on what some would call a very fancy complex base coat and then just calling these out and when you compare the two sides you can definitely see the model looks totally different. So I firmly believe there's no such thing as too many highlights. So I'm taking some of this Reaper Master Series paint. I'm not sure what it, what the name of it is. It's just a really, really light blue, almost like a pale blue. Um, it's one of the sample bottles they have and they just don't put the names of the paint on those. And then I'm ending up, I'm, I mix this about 50-50 or one-to-one -one with my uh, previous highlight that we use, that Hydra Turquoise Sky Blue mix. And I'm getting this pretty thin too because I don't want a whole lot built up on this model. I still want to kind of use it as like a thin, like almost glaze. And I'm just hitting up some of the very ridges of some of these highlights where more light would be caught on the model. And uh, this isn't a step that you need to do. It's just that I'm a big believer in super massive contrast and high, high highlights, right? So uh, we just go around the model a little bit and you can start to see how that's coming together. So this was another swamp pour that I did earlier. You can see this one's a little bit darker, so I'm getting some variance between the two, but this is what a finished, com a completely finished model would look like with these techniques put into play. And I think it makes it look really, really sweet. And uh, you get a cooler looking model on the table and it's just that little bit that puts you over that painted to tabletop standard. And it's really easy to do. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button in the corner and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If there's anything you want to learn about from my perspective for painting, uh, go ahead and leave, uh, leave that in the comments section below as well. Uh, I'm always looking for new things to do and if someone's looking for certain tips that might not, they might not be finding online, I'm happy to help you out with those. Otherwise, thanks for watching and I look forward to making the next video for you. So what we're going to be using in this video, some people might call it zenithal highlighting, some people might call it genital highlighting. That's what you do in Kingdom Death, Brian.